This is the day the eternal God has made. Welcome to Deerhurst Presbyterian Church this morning. Welcome to those who have gathered here in the sanctuary. Welcome to those who are with us at home. And then I guess I can also say, welcome to those who don't know that they're here yet because they will watch the service later in the day. But welcome. Um, a couple quick reminders. In your bulletin, there's a telephone number. That telephone number is my cell phone number. So if you have a joy or a concern that you would like to be a part of our prayers later in worship, you can text that to me already. We have a couple um, that people have texted to me so that we can um, add a sense of energy and urgency to our prayers later in worship. Um, Jace Ziegler Smith is two years old, and his grandma, who is Karen, the flowers on the chancel are in honor of Jace this morning. Um, there is a very, very wonderful, important meeting that's going to take place pretty close to immediately after worship, about 11.15. Anybody who has any interest in um, upcoming youth events, uh, YCMC Youth and Children's Ministries Church School is invited to the choir room um, immediately following worship. And we're gonna be talking about VBS, which in this case means a very special, but the very best Saturday. So um, anybody who wishes to be either just informationally, but or to offer gifts and talents are invited to the choir room following worship. All right. Now, Marnie, you're going to go back and be seated for a minute, because first they do this, then we do that. Right? No. Stilling and preparing our souls. I now talk to Mark. Mark plays. Then I return. No, you guys sing in, in a little bit. Okay, I'm going to go, I think it says right here, worship leader this morning is the Reverend Stephen E. Jones. I'm going to go sit down. Mark, still us, prepare us for the rest of what's going to happen.
In our tradition, baptism is a sacrament, which means it is an extraordinary experience of God's grace and love. In baptism, we celebrate that God's love for us comes before anything that we could have ever done to earn that love or deserve that love. Worship is a celebration of baptism. Worship is a celebration of the creator of the universe who has always loved us, creating place, space, and time for us to be together. God can be found anywhere and everywhere. Here we find each other finding God. And by here, I mean those who have gathered. By here, I mean those who are at home, participating from home. Let us join together in being called to worship. Come to our aid, compassionate one. We have need of your mercy. Listen to us now as we pray. Open our eyes to your works and our ears to your words of life. If we say, we can skip this part, we are in trouble. In our tradition, we start by recognizing that God has called us to worship. In our tradition, we then set aside a time to recognize that everything is not the way our God wants it to be. In regard to loving God with everything that is in us and loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, the temptation is to skip this part, but every Sunday we need time set aside to recognize that our selves are broken and our world is broken and our culture is broken. And the only place that we can find the healing we need is in God. And that's what God wants most for us. Let us come together in confessing our sin. Gracious God, you are the very definition of love, and we are the frequent distorters of it. Love is patient, but we want what we want when we want it. Love is kind, but kindness can be manipulative. It can even make us suspicious and uneasy. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude, but we would like to be number one. Love does not insist on its own way. But if we do not look out for ourselves, who will? Love is not irritable or resentful, 
But what if we're having a bad day? Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. But we get put out and we keep score. Love bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. But no one is going to take advantage of us. Love never ends. But at some point we have to opt out. We offer our excuses for love to experience the forgiveness, the refining fire, the inspiration of your love. O oh God, that we might die more to sin and live more and more to righteousness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we have a big youth and children's ministries meeting immediately following worship, a parent, a parent in need of a miracle. And in the story in scripture, it's a father. It could as easily have been a mother. A parent in need of a miracle for their child comes to Jesus. And Jesus looks at the parent and Jesus looks at us and says, do you believe? that I can do for you what you need to have done. And the parent responds for all of us. Said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. The good news of the gospel is this. In Jesus Christ, there is help for our unbelief. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Amen. Guide us, O Lord, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in, in, in you we will discover peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The lesson this morning comes from Psalm 24, and it is about the solemn entry into the temple which is a prayer commemorating the ceremony of the entry of the Ark of the Covenant into the temple. First, the qualities and purity of intention required to take part. Then, a dramatization of the entry of the great Ark through the gates. The first half is then a sort of examination of conscience, not unlike Psalm 14, about who is worthy to participate in the procession. The second half, is a liturgical lyric for the procession. Whether or not there was such a procession and such a festival, the psalm begins to mind, brings to mind the holiness of the temple and the awe in which it must be entered. Psalm 24. 
entrance into the temple. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, those who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. The word of the Lord. I trust in you, my faithful Lord, how perfect is your love. You answer me before I call, my hope, my strength, my song, and I shout for joy. I thank you, Lord. Your plan stands firm forever, and your praise will be continually pouring from my heart. I will bless you, Lord. I will bless you, Lord. How my soul cries out for you, my God, I will bless you, Lord. I trust in you, my faithful Lord, how perfect is your love. You answer me before I call My hope, my strength, my song And I shout for joy I thank you, Lord Your plan stands firm forever And your praise will be continually Pouring from my heart, I will bless you, Lord. I will bless you, Lord. How my soul cries out for you, my God. I will bless you, Lord. We continue on our way through Mark's Gospel. We're in the sixth chapter, but now we're beginning with verse 14. I read of the death of John the Baptist. Hear the word of the Lord. King Herod heard of all this, for by the time the name of Jesus was on everyone's lips, and Herod said, 
This has to be John the baptizer come back from the dead. That's why he is able to work miracles. Others said, no, it's Elijah. Others said, no, he's a prophet, like one of the prophets, one of the old time prophets. But Herod would not budge. It's John. Sure enough, I cut off his head and now he's back alive. Herod was the one who had ordered the arrest of John, put him in chains, sent him to prison at the nagging of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had provoked Herod by naming his relationship with Herodias adultery. Herodias smoldered with hate, wanting to kill him, but didn't dare because Herod was in awe of John. Convinced that he was a holy man, he gave him special treatment. Whenever he listened to him, as he was miserable with guilt, and yet he couldn't stay away. Something in John kept pulling him back. But a portentous day arrived when Herod threw a birthday party, inviting all the brass and blue buds in Galilee. Herodias' daughter entered the banquet hall and danced for the guests. She dazzled Herod, Herod and his guests. The king said to the girl, ask me anything. I'll give you anything you want. Carried away, he kept on. I swear I'll split my kingdom with you if you say so. She went back to her mother and said, what should I ask for? Ask for the head of John the baptizer. Excited, she ran back to the king and said, I want the head of John the baptizer served up on a platter and I want it now. The sobered the king up fast, but unwilling to lose faith with his guests, he caved in and let her have her wish. The king sent the executioner off to prison with orders to bring back John's head. He went, cut off John's head, brought it back on a platter and presented it to the girl who gave it to her mother. When Jesus' disciples heard about this, they came back, they got the body and they gave it a decent burial. This is the word of the Lord. I could understand if there wasn't a whole bunch of energy in your thanks be to God at the end of that story. Um, Thomas Jefferson, he took the New Testament, and as I understand it, he took the New Testament and a pair of scissors and he cut it all up. And he made his own book called The Life and Morals of Jesus Christ. And he did it by cutting up the New Testament, but the only pieces and parts that he included is the legacy of Christ and the teachings of Christ, the moral wisdom of Christ. Anything miraculous, anything too onerous, he cut out and he put on the cutting room floor. Everything else he included in this book. So mostly it's a collection of the moral teachings, the immediately accessible moral teachings of Jesus Christ. And there's something seductive about all of that, that if we could have a book that just made it easier to live, we had the essentials of what Jesus Christ taught in front of us in regard to caring and kindness and compassion and all of those things, there's something seductive about that. And you can be sure that this morning's scripture passage would have ended up on the cutting room floor. We read about the death of John the baptizer. And it really sounds like it should be something as a part of a Netflix series and not in the Bible. There doesn't seem to be any immediately accessible wisdom in this story. C.S. Lewis did something kind of equally seductive. He said, I got an idea. We're always fussing as to whether prayer works or not. And I've come up with a solution and we can prove without a shadow of a doubt to anybody who's interested whether prayer works or prayer does not work. So his proposal was this. We take a bunch of folks who have a really good track record for praying, okay? And then we have them pray for everybody in a certain hospital. And then we find another hospital that's very similar to that hospital. 
in terms of the kind of people that are there and how many people are there, and we have no one pray for the people in that hospital. And then we'll see very quickly. If the people in the one hospital get better faster or live longer or don't die as frequently, well, then we know that prayer works. You know, and the first time I read that, I said, that almost makes sense, but something's wrong there. Maybe there is a way that we can get faithful people together and pray in such a way that we can prove the validity of prayer. Well, C.S. Lewis was just fun with us because at the end of the story, it's in a book called God in the Docks, he said, oh yeah, but there's only one problem. Anybody of real faith in Jesus Christ could never pray for someone at the expense of someone else. So it doesn't work. But again, it's kind of seductive to think if there's something out there that makes life neater, that proves to us in our heart of hearts the validity of following Jesus Christ, the wisdom that he passes on to our live, work, and play lives. It makes our lives neater. It makes our lives more accessible to God, and it makes our lives less complicated. Now, this morning's scripture lesson is important, but it doesn't include any of that really accessible, convenient wisdom. In this morning's scripture lesson, there are two things that we need to latch on to. And the first is this. In the midst of all the complication, it is always the calling of the church to speak truth to power. And that's one of the stories that's at work there. John speaks truth to power. Herod, you can't do that. You can't do it and call it whatever it is you're calling it. And he won't give up. And Herod, strangely, has respect for John for all of that. And then the politics of the court get involved. And all of a sudden there's a dance. And everybody's really impressed. And all of a sudden there's a request. And all of a sudden, the head of John the baptizer is on a platter. But the church of Jesus Christ must always be reminded that it is to speak truth to power. Now, it's life work for the church of Jesus Christ because we're not very good at it. Because we're sometimes confused and we can't come up with one voice in regard to what is truth. And we certainly can't come up with one voice in regard to which which power needs to be spoken to first, and how do we speak to it. But it is our calling nonetheless. So even though it might not be immediately accessible and neat in our lives, the first thing that we get from the scripture passage, which I have not preached from in 35 years, the first thing that I think is ours is to hear that the church of Jesus Christ is called always to speak truth to power. And the second thing is right at the beginning of the passage. Herod is saying, hmm, it's got to be John the baptizer. And somebody else says, no, 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 it's Elijah. And somebody else says, no, it's one of those good old time prophets who, according to Frederick Beeker, never get invited back to dinner a second time. So there's conversation about who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Our life work as the Church of Jesus Christ is to speak truth to power, and our life work as the Church of Jesus Christ is to continually be in conversation with who is this Jesus Christ? And the problem with Thomas Jefferson's Bible is what he gives us is knowledge and wisdom, but he doesn't give us anything that we can truly be in relationship with. So the call for the church of Jesus Christ out of this passage is, we are to be in relationship with Jesus Christ, and we are to spend each and every moment as a community, each and every moment as individuals within this community, trying to figure out who he is. And to listen carefully as he over and over and over again speaks truth to power in such a way the power has him killed, but in such a way that three days later, power realizes that it wasn't anywhere near as powerful as thought it was. 
Amen. Prayers of the people, where are we in prayer this morning? We have talked about Jay Ziegler Smith and the flowers on the chancel in honor of his second birthday. We're also talking about Ron Smith and his 72nd birthday. And I've been asked by Karen to traveling mercies for a dozen people flying in to celebrate Jason's second and Ron's 72nd on the 17th of July. So we add them to our prayers. Donna Seep has asked that we add her sister, Diane Guerra, to our prayers. Diane was having a regular heartbeat through the night. Um, Donna says, I told her to go to urgent care. Since her blood pressure was fine, they are sending her to Buff General by ambulance. She asks that we keep uh, Diane and uh, Dom and family in our prayers this morning. Also, I guess you could say I've been a little bit of an ambassador for announcing to the world that Kara Mattelliano and Ken Vetter are now engaged. And so they're right there. And, uh, and that's a wonderful thing. Applause is appropriate. And I said to Kara, I said, well, you know, I've been telling everybody. It's really exciting. And I said, but I probably better stop and just let you tell people. And she said, no, it's kind of fun. You can tell people. So uh, that's, that's a, a wonderful thing to celebrate. It's also wonderful to see some magnificently familiar faces in church. It's great to see the Whites with us this morning. It's great to see the O'Briens with us this morning. Um, George Nash celebrated his 103rd birthday um, the last week. And so um, just so you know, what do you get a man who's 103? The answer is simple, chocolate. <laughs> chocolate is what you get a man who is 103. He, he likes that just about more than anything else. And the only person I know who might like chocolate more than George is David Smith, but that's. Let us come together in prayer. Loving God. Wonderful to have more people in the sanctuary this morning. Wonderful to have things to celebrate. Folks gathering on Grand Island yesterday to, um, in the end, raise over $10,000 to fight cancer and then enjoy each other's company sitting in the shade 
um, and talking about what's going on in their lives besides riding a bicycle for a cure. Um, it is wonderful to celebrate second birthdays and 76th birthdays and 103rd birthdays. It is wonderful to celebrate the return of folks we have been missing. It is wonderful to have a very clear calling. The Church of Jesus Christ must speak truth to power. And the Church of Jesus Christ must be in relationship with Jesus Christ. Make your presence felt this day. We pray for all the people on our prayer list. And we pray for Diane Guerra. And we pray for a meeting in the choir room afterwards where we talk about VBS, a very best Saturday that hopefully and prayerfully will be in our future. Lord, make your presence felt. There are the grieving. We would bring your comfort and your remembrance into their lives. There are the wondering, what is next? What does life look like down the way with so many unknowns in their lives? And some of that is physical unknowing. Um, and some of that is spiritual and emotional unknowing. We have the grieving, we have the wondering, and then we have the joying, those who are full of joy right now and trying to find a way in the midst of coming out of feeling powerfully isolated, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, how to share that joy with the world around us. Make your presence felt this day, Lord, as you always do. It is in Christ's name we pray. Praying together the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to think about all that we have to be thankful for. And that thankfulness is connected to the giving of our time and our talent and our treasure.
God, use our offerings of money, time, and talents to enliven your church, to enhearten a world prone to discouragement, to enable the spreading of the love of Christ. May all, all our gifts and all our giving be acceptable in your sight. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. And now, the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship, communion, and support of the Holy Spirit, let it be ours this day, every day, now and forevermore. Amen. It's so far in a wonderful 